Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the inaugural class of the Ethics of Technological Disruption. I'm Hillary Cohen, a pre-doctoral fellow here at Stanford's Center for the Ethics in Society. And on behalf of our full team, we are thrilled to be welcoming you here tonight and to be kicking off what we expect will be a series of meaningful and hopefully educational conversations. Our topic tonight and over the next several months will be the profound ethical, social, and political questions that emerge as a result of technological change. Much of it funded by firms just down the street on Sand Hill Road, generated by companies here in the Bay Area, and seeded by the research and education at this very university. We believe the stakes are high. The premise of this course is that there are few things more important to consider when it comes to the long-run well-being of humanity. The Israeli historian Yuval Harari describes it this way. Nobody would doubt that the new technologies will enhance the collective power of humankind, but the question we should be asking ourselves is what's happening at the individual level. We have enough evidence from history that you can have a very big step forward in terms of collective power, coupled with a step backwards in terms of individual happiness and individual suffering. So we need to ask ourselves about the new technologies emerging at present, not only how are they gonna impact the collective power of humankind, but also how are they gonna impact the daily lives of individuals? In terms of history, he provocatively writes, the events in the Middle East of ISIS and all of that is just a speed bump on history's highway. It's not very important. Silicon Valley is much more important. It's the world of the 21st century. And to be sure, the speed of technological advancement and of disruption can be dizzying. So many of you in the audience may have seen the latest internet meme circulating on the web over the last week or so, the 2009 versus 2019 challenge, or the hashtag 10-year challenge. If you haven't, it's fairly simple. People post on the one hand a uh, picture of themselves from 10 years ago, and then just next to that, a more recent photo of themselves. And it's meant to show just how much progress or change one can experience in a decade of life. So here you have a couple of examples, for those of you who haven't seen it. So now if we were to do a similar exercise with some of the largest tech companies or events related to, to technology's impact on society, it might look something like this. In 2009, you might see Mark Zuckerberg proudly proclaiming the mission of Facebook to give people, sorry, I think we're on automatic uh, proceeding to give people the automatic power to share and make the world more open and connected. A statement that would later change, but one that reflects the sincere aspirations of idealistic technologists. You might see the beginnings of some online organizing that would usher in the Arab Spring the following year. The democratic uprising across the Middle East that demonstrated the power of technology to foster positive social and political change. You might see President Obama issuing his first weekly address directly to citizens across the country using YouTube, in which he described the opportunity to restore science to its rightful place and wield technology's wonders. And you might see that the most powerful American companies represented a mix of different industries, from Exxon to Citigroup to Microsoft. So let's contrast this with some of the pictures you might see today. A Facebook that has been roiled by a set of scandals, including election interference and privacy violations and failures to moderate content appropriately around the world. You might see some of the very same technologies used to give young advocates of democracy a voice are now also being used by authoritarian governments to wield more control, evidenced by China's citizen score. You might see that the President of the United States is tweeting about how tech companies are trying to silence or suppress the voices of conservatives of half of our country on their sites. And you might see that America's five largest and most powerful companies are exclusively technology companies. Apple and Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook and Microsoft. 
which are professional homes for many of you. Now, of course, this isn't the full story of what's happened in technology over the last 10 years. There have been extraordinary developments, new products, services, and companies that solve real problems while fueling the economic growth that we've seen around the world. But it's impossible to deny that over the last 12 to 18 months, we've also witnessed growing pushback or skepticism about the way the technology driving this progress has influenced the lives of people and communities. There's been a shift in the general population's attitude and the amount of political scrutiny aimed at the creators of technology and those who have reaped the benefits of its creation. A transition in part described by the early hopes of liberation technology to at times fears now of technological dystopia. So perhaps this was inevitable. You know, after all, as a society, we're now forced to come to terms with genuinely new concerns. Questions about data and privacy, about the impact that automation will have on the future of work and on politics, about the roles that both private companies and governments should play in shaping the lives of ordinary citizens and in either upholding or possibly diminishing democratic institutions. Though we'll touch on many of these, our task here is not to fall down simply on one side of any single debate. It's not to add to either the roster of boosterish endorsements of technology's benefits or the scathing critiques of a specific company or industry. Our aim, rather, is to moderate a series of conversations that explore the dilemmas that emerge when technological aspirations bump up against the realities of politics and inequality and a plurality of visions of for what a good society looks like. It's to begin to wrestle in earnest with the massive benefits of technological progress right alongside the significant costs that sometimes accompany it. And we've assembled a group of experts from industry, from government, and from civil society to represent the full range of perspectives that these topics deserve. So in preparation for this exploration, we asked you a couple of questions about the roles that you play, if any, in the tech sector, about the issues you're most interested in, and we asked a set of questions about the state of affairs today. The first, how well equipped do you think US policymakers are to govern a society that will be transformed by technology in the years ahead? On a scale of one to 10, the average answer, as you see here, amongst you was a three. And not a single person gave our policymakers above a six. Now on the one hand, this seems comical, right? It reflects what many of us have seen as ill-informed handling of tech issues by politicians, perhaps most memorably with Senator Hatch asking Mark Zuckerberg how, despite its free services, Facebook possibly makes money. Now, on the other hand, if you're right, this should actually alarm us that the people charged with governing new technologies have such little understanding of how it actually works. In the words of our colleague Shannon Valor, who is a philosopher of technology at Santa Clara University, well, we shouldn't expect our elected representatives to all share a deep knowledge of technical or scientific matters. They do have a duty to be acquainted with the basic operations of our most powerful forces and institutions that are shaping our nation, especially when they are tasked with regulating those forces. So we also asked you about your faith in technology companies to confront new challenges, and possibly reflecting the bias of our audience or of our geography, you had a slightly higher expectation, averaging at about a five out of 10 with fairly equal measures of skepticism and optimism on either side. But most importantly, you told us about the issues that drew your interest in this course, about those that give you pause and those that give you hope. We intend to cover a large portion of these topics over the next few months, and I want to tell you a little bit about the team that we have on side to help us navigate them. So in addition to myself, we'll be joined in every session by uh, three Stanford faculty members. First is computer scientist Mehran Sahami, who is partially responsible for the enormous growth and success of the computer science department here. He teaches the single largest class at the university. 
intro to computer science, uh, and spent a decade in industry before joining the faculty. Then we have political philosopher Rob Reich, who has proudly confessed that he, like any good philosopher, often delivers more questions than answers. Um, he's the director of two centers here on campus. Just leave the photo so you can see us all. Um, the Center for Ethics and Society and the Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society. And finally, we have political scientist Jeremy Weinstein, who, among his other roles, is the director of the Global Studies Division here. And having served in both terms of the Obama administration brings practical government experience to the team. In parallel to this class, the four of us have been working for over a year to develop a related undergraduate course, which we kicked off last week. We have roughly 300 Stanford students, future technologists, inventors, policymakers, and activists enrolled, who over the next 10 weeks will be diving into the code, the public policy, and the ethical frameworks that underpin technological change. And our course flow in here will mirror the four core units that we will be covering in that course. So to remind you, they'll be, starting next week, first, algorithmic decision making and accountability, then privacy and data collection and civil liberties, with an emphasis in here on facial recognition, then the ethics of autonomous systems, with an emphasis on military use of AI, and then the power of private platforms. Some of the undergraduates are actually here with us tonight, and with their help, we are thrilled to be thinking differently about how you train and equip the next generation of technologists and leaders to think about their roles and responsibilities to society. So just one note on format before I introduce the guests who will be joining us. Ordinarily, we would love and expect to have microphones on hand for you to ask questions. After all, that's a central part of the sort of engagement that a university intends to foster. But uh, because we are recording these sessions and we need written consent forms for audio and video recording, we'll instead be collecting uh, questions from you digitally in advance, which many of you submitted tonight, and we'll let you know how you can do it for the sessions moving forward. Uh, but without further ado, in order to help us understand the full landscape of these challenges, we're kicking off tonight with two distinguished guests. Reid Hoffman co-founded LinkedIn and is currently a partner at Greylock Partners. He's on the boards of many technology companies, including Microsoft and Airbnb, as well as several nonprofit organizations. He hosts a podcast called Masters of Scale and recently released a new book, Blitz Scaling, based on his Stanford course of the same name. We're also joined by Nicole Wong, who previously served as Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States in the Obama administration, focused on internet privacy and innovation policy. And prior to her time in government, Nicole was Google's Vice President and Deputy General Counsel and Twitter's Director for Legal, Pro Legal Director for Products. Please join me in welcoming everyone to the stage. I'm going to get us started with a, a general question about um, the framing and the moment we're in that uh, Nicole uh, described at the start. Not, it's Nicole, Hillary described at the start. Um, the issue is to take stock of the early optimism, the almost utopianism <clears throat> that attended the tech industry at its founding, chiefly here in Silicon Valley, and the moment we find ourselves in now in which there's great fears of the tech industry producing a kind of dystopia. So um, for our guests, I just want to read representative examples of some of the expressions that have been offered. So the following was said by President Ronald Reagan in 1989, just a few months before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Quoting from him as president, the Goliath of totalitarianism will be brought down by the David of the microchip. I believe, he said, that more than armies, more than diplomacy, and more than the best intentions of democratic nations, the communications revolution emanating from Silicon Valley will be the greatest force for the advancement of human freedom the world has ever seen. A few years later, then President George H.W. Bush said that he asked the world to imagine if the internet took hold in China, just imagine how freedom would spread. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch said, quote, advances in the technology of telecommunications have proved an unambiguous threat to totalitarian regimes everywhere. All right, now fast forward to 2018. I'm going to read you the opening paragraph of an article that I just came across. 
captures the sour mood of the day. Quote, mobile technologies distract adults and depress kids. <laughs> Twitter is mostly a bad platform full of Nazis and assholes. <laughs> Facebook and YouTube blend cheerful upworthiness, pathological self-revelation, and malignant deceit. Delivered to hyper-personalized, addictive filter bubbles optimized to capture our attention for sale. The open web is a vast, soul-sapping wasteland of sexual depravity and medical malpractice, <laughs> and the Internet of Things is nothing less than an emerging panopticon. And behind all of this good work lies the disruptive innovation of a small band of predatory, plutocratic, enriching monopolies inspired by a toxic mix of swashbuckling ambition and moral preening. <laughs> what Comment. Happened? Yeah, <laughs> end, end of quote. Nicola Reed, what happened in those 30 years between those two quotes? <laughs> That's a great setup. I was going to say, like, we're going to try and have you leave happy tonight. But we always, you're, you're setting the challenge really high. Um, so I, I actually wasn't sure what you were going to read. Like, uh, I wrote down a quote that you'll probably remember, John Perry Barla's Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, right? right? I and, could have started there. Right? And, yeah. Well, so, so here's the, the thing that I caught on to. You do not know our culture our ethics or the unwritten codes that already provide our society more order than could be obtained by any of your, meaning government's, impositions, right? The, the optimism of the belief that cyberspace was going to be this borderless place where we would all rule ourselves because we knew exactly how this was gonna play out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you look back and go, oh, wouldn't have that have been nice? Yeah. Um, and even in the, in the laws that we eventually put in place that followed, so for example, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act or Section uh, 230, which is highly debated now, which uh, regulates the, the content liability for, for platforms. In the conversations in Congress around the development of those laws, there was a, a real sense of like, we have to protect the internet. It is a place for growth. It is a place for innovation. It will be a place for, for individuals to express themselves freely. So the laws were actually generated with the notion like this is a fragile ecosystem that we should protect. Um, and we have now come to this place where all we want to do is shut things down. Um, or at least that seems to me to be the meme in, in DC right now. It just yeah. apropos that, that point, I was a part of a committee here at Stanford maybe five or six years ago that was tasked every 25, 30 years they put one together to review the quality of the undergraduate education. And when this happened five or six years ago, one thing that occurred to us is, well, how has technology changed the experience of students at the university? And we polled the faculty about what they would wish with respect to technology at Stanford University. And the main thing the faculty expressed a desire for was an internet kill switch in every single classroom. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I think part of the question is it's not, I, I describe myself as a techno-optimist, not a techno-utopian, yeah. which means just because you can build the technology doesn't necessarily mean it ends up in the, uh, in the right place. But actually, in fact, technology is more often the answer than the problem. Mm -hmm. And the way that you look at it is say, look, there are definitely, we have a bunch of different kind of birthing problems. Because exactly as Nicole said, you know, the, the initial kind of uh, early days of the internet, a la John Perry Barlow and EFF and else, say, well, we used to have this kind of very centrally kind of controlled by large companies and also, you know, media channel. How do we give freedom to individual voices? How do we allow people to express themselves? I mean, like one of the things during that I was really delighted about in the kind of the the blogging uh, arena during the Iraq War was was being able to read blogs from the Iraqi civilians and so forth, and the humanizing and connecting and figuring out like kind of what's the yeah. what's the right way to do that. And so there's a lot of uh, good there now and in the past. And then the question is to say. Well, how do you reshape it mm -hmm. so that you have it? And the, the reflex to say, you know, kill switch mm -hmm. uh, is a reflex I don't think is right. right. Um, mm -hmm. I think the question is, is to, to say, okay, and by the way, we have this challenge, of course, which is, well, as you're making social policy, you have a lot of different conflicting interest groups that have this interest or that. 
um, you know, one of the challenges that, that Facebook has right now is you have, uh, you know, uh, forces, generally speaking, on the left saying, how do you allow all this fake news and filter bubbles? And you have forces on the right, just like the tweet from President Trump saying, you're silencing, you know, yeah. conservative voices. And so right. they're getting fire from both sides. Yeah. And resolving that is, 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 is challenging. And so um, I tend to think that, you know, it's kind of... Uh, you know, you always have to refactor technologies as you go. Um, and I think some of the question, and of course, what we'll be addressing some tonight and ongoing is, you know, well, given that hard problem, what are the right questions asked and what are puzzle pieces of things we might be considering or might consider? Because, you know, like, again, you go to your opening thing and you say, well, uh, confidence in government setting the policy, uh, average score two. Um, <coughs> Uh, and I was curious if you'd included the zero in your survey, what would have happened? <laughs> right. um, and then, you know, and confidence in, in, in company, five to six, which relatively, because this all comes out of relative, is really much higher, yeah. but still has challenges and problems. I just have a model in my head for why we got here, and, and I'm actually interested in, in whether you saw this in your businesses as well, which is, if you think back to sort of the, the development of the internet in the early days of 20 years ago, right, it was largely here, right? It was largely US centric. The companies that were building the products were here. Um, it was largely being used by us, Europe, Japan, and Australia and Canada to some extent. But that, that was pretty much the set. So that's a set of countries where our values are largely aligned, our judicial systems are largely aligned. We are mostly in the same place in terms of our treatment of freedom of expression and privacy. Um, and then, in my experience at least, around 2005, 2006, 2007, when internet penetration in some of the developing world, Brazil, India, Russia, China, really started to take off, you end up having this audience and communities coming onto the platforms that had previously been dominated by I'm going to call them Western democracies as a shorthand, um, that have really different values, that have really different systems of adjudicating fairness and um, individual liberty. And I think that that caused a, a real conflict, both at a policy level, but also at a technical level of like, how do I deal with this? Because my experience with engineers who were building for these platforms, I'd say like, so where are you going to launch this product? And they'd be like, Big CJK, which stood for, in French, Italian, German, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. And I'm like, those are languages, not countries. So we, we have to talk about the countries, not just the distribution. But if I can push on that a little bit, Nicole, uh, as a sort of frame for thinking about when the challenges began, let's take the kind of you know, Western advanced democracies, the United States, European countries, maybe the initial engines beginning here and spreading into Europe. There are pretty dramatically different perspectives about how to regulate uh, you know, technology companies, even among that set of countries that presumably, as you described, share a set of common values. I don't know if folks have been to Europe recently, but since the adoption of the GDPR, a key legal framework in Europe, what you'll find is that when you turn on your phone and you try to use Google Maps or you go uh, to some website, you are giving all sorts of permission for every single step you take and are being told all sorts of things about how your data is going to be used that, that we are in the background of everything in the United States. So even among these countries with shared values that facilitated this growth, they're just dramatically different perspectives about the ownership of data, about uh, the ways in which technology companies should be governed. How do you think about the origins of those differences? Like what drives those really different perspectives? And from both of your sort of different roles, both at companies but also in government, how do you think about what the implications are for the United States as we grapple with some of these challenges from how Europe has begun to move? There's Small a question. whole, I was like, I was like, saying, like <laughs> a whole bunch in that question. Yeah. So, so the difference is, you're right, which is the difference is even between the countries at the very early start were were different, and I think to me the challenge, the reason it was a little easier to deal with is like if you were going to get a government demand in Europe, it was probably going to be 
a law enforcement official who had credentials, who was going to present you with legal process. There was a judicial court that was going to deal with that. You go into India or Brazil, that's actually not how that's going to go down. That it's going to be cops at the door in your office waiting for you to take the servers away, right? So, so it's a, it's, it was just a different moment if you were at a company trying to manage the legal issues around that. Um, but the, the differences in country law have always been there. So the, the sort of privacy dimension in general, yes, Europe, because of its history and its use of data um, against its citizens, particularly during World War II, has a lot of more sensibilities around how data gets collected and used and, and governed than in the United States, where we have largely thought of it as a consumer protection issue as opposed to a human rights issue, which is how it's framed in Europe. Um, we have largely let it be uh, regulated at the Federal Trade Commission level, which is a, a like with a commercial idea or an economic and consumer idea behind it, again, as opposed to a human rights level as it would be in Europe. Europe also has things right that we've always dealt with, which is in Germany and France, it's illegal to traffic in Nazi memorabilia. In here, it's a First Amendment issue. Um, and, and so you've had to deal with those types of differences. I've found the challenges to be once you, you can sort of do it at the margins of like, okay, like we're not gonna have hate speech on the platforms or whatever. But once you start getting into countries where it's a radically different sense of, is it permissible to have LGBTQ content on your site? It's clearly illegal in some of these countries. What is the resolution gonna be? And when you build a platform that's global, you have to make choices. Either the content comes down, you're IP blocking it, you're, you're taking some step in order to be able to be in market. And one of the challenges when you look at the differential European approach to saying ask for permission more than ask for forgiveness is it's among the reasons why, because by the way, there's a ton of talented technologists, great technical universities, uh, you know, a stack of things, and yet very little of these world-changing uh, technologies are coming out of Europe for the global scale. Like, like, they have all the talent and everything else. I mean, you have Skype and you've got, you know, Supercell and you've got these other things, but, it, but it's a relatively short list. You consider where browsers are built, uh, which ones, you know, created the networks, think about search engines, think about all these sorts of things. And, uh, and part of, I think, the relevant question um, is what's the way that we get to developing that? Because if you say, well, um, we, we, we should shift more towards Europe, that may say that, well, we should be more like, like for example, like in the position in Europe, you're the rest of the world. And so the rest of the world will develop those technology platforms, you know, maybe Asia, other kinds of places. And so you have to kind of balance that out. Now, I actually, as part of saying techno-optimist, I actually think that these things are refactorable. So I tend to be in the, look, you have to make sure that there are, there are there, there are some critically bad things like medical stuff and other kinds of things where you go, no, 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 get it right first. But there's other things where you say, you look at it and say, okay, that was a problem, now let's change it. And so I tend to, when I go over to Europe and talk about this, I tend to advocate for more of a like, like <coughs> refactoring than an ask for permission, you know, a forgiveness than a permission as an approach. If I can ask, where do you draw that line? How do you think about what the harms sure. are that you're willing to accept? to have that flexibility. So in this book that I uh, published last year and fall quarter, um, Blitzscaling, I described kind of three kinds of risks that uh, Blitzscaling companies should, should track and pay attention to. And part of this was, one part of the book was, you know, here's how technology companies of the future are going to be uh, shaped by a set of techniques that we learn here in Silicon Valley, also practice in China to help other areas in the world. But another one was, how do I help evolve that practice about how we're doing it? One was, you have uh, serious uh, kind of like, you know, um, health implications for individuals, right? So an example of something I wrote a, an essay on as a, as a failure case was Theranos. Right, so you say, okay, if you're making bad blood tests, and so it does, you shouldn't be blitz scaling that, you should be tracking that. Another one is if you have a kind of a, 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 a you know, kind of a, a, a moderate impact across a large number of people, then that's something you should, you should consider too. Or if you're gonna break the system, like break a, a, like a payment system or a logistic system and that sort of thing. But within that basis, um, 
you know, generally speaking, you want to kind of actually try it and see it and refactor it. So for example, if you say, well, okay, these scooters are cluttering up our streets. We should have had them ask for permission first. It's like, well, like you know, people have to be careful about like what does it mean for you know, like uh, possible accidents and fatalities and so forth. But a refactoring of cluttering on your streets with scooters is actually something you can refactor. So that's, that's the kind of the framework that I sketched in the book. Uh, I was addressing business people and the entrepreneurs doing this. Um, but it's also a, a framework which you can think about as a general society as well. I, I want to pick up, if we can, on one of the threads that uh, Nicole introduced, which is this idea of um, complying with various government requests when the range of values or legitimacy of that government might be different in different contexts. So right now there's you know, a lot of debate on this sort of topic. You, know, you see Netflix taking down this comedy special that uh, had to do with Saudi Arabia and, and Mohammed bin Salman, and you know, they chose to take it down. You have um, people protesting or at least asking questions about whether or not Google can, should re-enter China given their record on uh, the way they might use the technology. You know, how much room is there for an American company to assert its American values when uh, it is trying to operate in a global scale and global contexts um, in areas that have these different values? Yeah, so um, I think it's part of it is like stop thinking of yourself as an American. You're going to build a global platform, think of yourself as a global platform, and 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 adjust accordingly. And I say that, I, my training is at a, as a First Amendment lawyer, right? So like, I, like, you, I, I was like, I want to be a lawyer so I can pound the table about the First Amendment. Um, and, and being at Google, I had to readjust, right? So when we acquired YouTube, what had largely been a, 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 an internet of, you could cabin a market because there was a language barrier, right? But once you get into video and images, it's, it's visual, so it's global automatically. So an audience that was intended for Turkey is now being seen in Greece and elsewhere. And, and the sensibilities are really different. One of the issues I had early on with, with YouTube was um, we were global. Uh, someone posted a number of videos about the king in Thailand. And they were offensive. They were pictures of him with a foot over his head, which is extremely offensive, with his face made into a monkey, and um, things that were clearly intended to defame the king. And that is illegal in Thailand. They have what's called a les majeste law. It makes it illegal to criticize the king. So if you're an American with a First Amendment background, you're like, what are you talking about? The whole purpose of free expression is to be able to criticize your leader. And so. The question came because the, we were contacted by the Ministry of Information in Thailand. They said, we're going to block you. Take down these videos, or we will block you. Um, and I actually then traveled to Thailand to try and understand what was going on, to meet with their government officials, to meet with our own like US embassy to get some background, to meet with people on the ground in Thailand to understand this law. The most salient thing that I was told was actually by one of the, the diplomats from, from the United States who told me, like. This is a country which over the last 27 years has had 21 coups. The king, who was in his, approaching his 80s at the time, was the only source of stability in their country for a generation. So it means a lot to have insulted him. And that is felt not just at like the highest estrelons, but like all the way through the, the country. And so for me as a First Amendment lawyer, I have to back away from my sense of like, revolt against your government, have the ability to criticize, and start to think from their perspective, what is appropriate speech that, that creates civil discourse, right? What, what, is, what is the thing that is, that is essential to that culture and be respectful of that because I am a global platform. Um, and I think that that, at the time, like 2007, that felt like a really big leap for me to make. And now, knowing where we are in our current political atmosphere, I'm like, OK. <laughs> so it's not just isolated to certain countries. But so if you go back uh, let me to add one thing before you. That, so I uh, agree with everything Nicole said. I, think, I would say one thing, and it's not so much as, a, as, as promoting a specific set of American values, but I do think that one of the things that a company should do is say, look, this is what we stand for. This is who we are. This is what we're fighting for. And so, you know, in the LinkedIn context, 
it was we're fighting for um, kind of individuals' ability to maximize taking control of their own economic destiny. Um, so we, we, we don't as much address freedom of speech issues because we said, look, that's not necessarily <coughs> tied to it. But what is tied to it is um, if you can represent what your skills are, what your ability to work is. So if you have a country that says, oh, these people aren't allowed to work or whatever, we still put the, we, 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 we would still put their profiles up. We'd still you know, kind of facilitate that. So I think it's good to say these are the things that we stand for and we're doing to be clear about them and then to navigate that. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, for example, um, you know, when we, I think we kind of surprised the Russian government um, when you know, they were like, okay, well, we want all this data because we want to be able to have control of it. We're like, no, no, we protect our members, so we're not going to do that, and you can do what you need to do because we're not going to hand over individual data in bulk without, um, you know, without some sense of protection here. We'd rather not operate if you force us not to operate. Right, but that, I mean, herein lies a, a fascinating point, which is that it's not an example of asserting American values. It's about you know a company having its own values. And actually, when we think about the identities of these companies, you know, whether it is, you know, maybe they happen to be hosted here, but they have a self conception that isn't tethered to the geography in which they happen to be rooted. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, I think to push on that point a little bit, I mean, the notion of a company having its own identity is that you could think of the company having an identity, but a company's also made up of a bunch of technologists mm -hmm. who also have their view about the work they're doing, that either they can communicate to the management of that company or they can actually encode a set of <coughs> values into what they actually build in that company. And so when you think about sort of the different leverage points that way, what an individual technologist can do, what the company wants to do more broadly in terms of fighting for its values, what happens when journalists want to shine a light on a particular issue, where are the leverage points? How do you see you know, running a company or as a regulator how you navigate all these things to try to come to some sort of place that you think is leading to a better outcome when there's all these competing leverage points? Well, I know, I know that Reed has done this because he and I have worked together for over the years. And so, right, like one of the things as a company and as the leadership of a company is, is you find your North Star, right? Which is like, what are the essential parts of us as a company, of the things that really mean a lot to us and, and that we would be prepared to defend? And, and some of the work I do now is talking to young companies about like, forcing them into what are pretty hard conversations. Like, what would you defend if it came to it? Right? Is it open internet? Is it the privacy of your users? Is it the free expression of uh, the ability of, of people around the world? Whatever that is, but, but knowing that helps you create your strategies going forward. And then from that, once you have the North Star, there's very tactical operational decisions about like which markets do we enter? With what products do we enter them? How do we build those products? And then it's, it's really the tail end then, right? The things that I was talking about, like taking down certain videos, then you're really like at the very edge of it because you made the hard choices up here. All right, well, let, and part of what Go you ahead. do is you build the company culture around it. So I think it's really important to say, here's what we would rather fail, here's where we would rather shut down, here's where they're in doing this, this is who we are. And by the way, if that's not what you want to do, this is the wrong company for you to be working at. Right? You should go work at a different company. Um, and so I think it's really good for these companies to say, this is what our mission is, this is what we believe in. All right, good. Well, let's take another test of that. So one of the things that's been in the news about some of the companies that you either work at or on the board of now, Google and YouTube, um, Nicole, or Microsoft in your case, Reed, mm -hmm. question arises whether or not the technological developments or products that these companies are advancing should be sold to or put to the use for military purposes, especially on behalf of the U.S. government. These are, after all, U.S. companies. Um, and you know, I think most people here in the room know about the Project Maven issue here at Google. So I take your, your statement just now, Rita, as, well, you should know what you're getting into, and maybe you shouldn't be working at the company. So the employees who rebelled against Project Maven at Google, your answer to them is, quit, go find a different company to work at. Well, I mean, Google has to say, and this is not you know, my place to, because I'm not a yeah. Google, Googler in this. But Google has to say, this is who we are and this is who we're not. Right. Now, if it were me in that position, I'd say, look, I actually think that uh, there's, there's uh, various ways in which, look, we are an American company, we have responsibilities to the American state and the citizenry and society. And some of that is making society uh, safer. Yep. So we do actually have an obligation to interface with the uh, DOD in some ways, and there's things we can do that we're Pareto, the world's better off and the U.S. is better off, and we're going to go do that, and if you're not comfortable with that, maybe you should work somewhere else. That right. would be my 
Well, well how about Facebook? Uh, not Facebook, yeah, Microsoft. So Microsoft has facial recognition technology. It could yeah. sell it to non-democratic governments. Should it? Uh, well, so this is a place where as a board member, I should say, well, I should defer to the company, <laughs> right, in terms of this stuff. Like, I'm not, it's Satya and everything else. I think that you, companies do have a responsibility to think about, and Microsoft does this, Satya, Brad Smith, they're very high principled folks, saying, look, how do we think this is going to be used? Do we think it's, it, it, it's a good use or not? And if no, then you don't do it, right? So now, for example, if, 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 a, if just like Country X said, well, we want to develop the following kind of bioweapon, and you happen to be in our country, and we want you to do that. The answer is no. That's a bad thing. It's, it, it's, it, 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 like it's a disaster. Now, they say, well, we think actually a facial recognition thing that will work in airports for terrorism and will be part of how we're operating. We're going to have a well-organized legal and judicial system. We're going to organize through that. It will actually make society more safe. Then as long as you're, you know, I tend to have a big fan of, of, of well-organized democracies, you know, we can have a discussion about whether or not we're currently in one or not, <laughs> right? But, 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 uh, but you know, then, then that's a different question. Can, can I follow up on, on one of the things Nicole said, uh, which is this notion of a North Star? You're talking to startups. I think that idea resonated with both of you. You should know what lines you draw. For a lot of us who aren't in technology companies, but we may be users of the products generated by technology companies or citizens affected by the impact of technology companies, is there some obligation for companies to communicate what that North Star is? Because part of the, you know, the example that Hillary gave with Facebook's initial mission statement and you can look at the evolution of Facebook's mission statement over time. Uh, we could take Uber as another example. Um, we are discovering what the North Star is uh, over time, which is quite at odds with what we had perhaps been communicated about what the North Star is. So how do we think about, like, is that an internal guidance for the company? Is it something that, uh, you know, for the purposes of investors thinking about investing and buying shares, that that's something that ought to be communicated much more clearly and, and publicly. And of course, part of what's hard is that that's an evolving thing as you yeah. think about entering new companies or confronting new frontiers. But help me, help me understand it from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, in every country, a company is, is a little bit different, right? But I do think um, the exercise of your executives and actually, frankly, to, to make sure that your executives cohere well is to get them on the same page in terms of that North Star. And those are really hard conversations, in my experience, like to, to get everybody in one place. Um, and then it becomes usually, in my experience, part of the things you communicate outwardly. You, you're either communicating it by virtue of the way your products work, or you're communicating it because you have a mission statement or a filing with the SEC that you have to do, right? So typically, that would, that would be the case. Now, you do have companies that say one thing and do a different thing, which is a separate problem, I think, than determining what your North Star is going to be. And so, yeah. look, I generally think, I don't think this is something you can easily put in a policy or law, but I think it's much better and much more principled for companies to say, this is who we are, this is what we're doing, this is what we're shooting for. Um, sometimes you, of course, have secret plans that you don't reveal to your competitors, but part of, like, for example, very early days in LinkedIn, the kind of cultural ethos that we established with the whole company is if what you were doing was printed on the front page of the New York Times, could you go to your friends and say, yeah, yeah, this is a reasonable thing to be doing, and that kind of thing is a, is a way of doing it and building that culture um, uh, from very early. And you know, I'm a critic of, like, I think it's okay to kind of advocate for different uh, regulation by building a product into it where, where you say, actually, in fact, I think the, the way our society should change, so like take Uber, it's like, like, in fact, no, we shouldn't be locked into taxi monopolies. We're better off with logistics as a service. It'll make society better. That I was, I'm strongly supportive of. The, we're now going to hack the app so the government officials look differently to them as they're coming out to that. That they shouldn't do. And that should, they should be hit with a stick with. <laughs> right? So, so it, it's kind of sum and sum on these things, and it plays to the point, is like, they say one thing, do another, <laughs> bad, right? right. Um, but also, like, like you, could, you should be advocating for a different regulatory stance, not trying to fake it. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna push one, one time here, too, because, you know, as, like Jeremy, I'm not an insider in a tech company, and I can listen to and hear the wonderful statements about organizational culture and having a North Star and leading with your values, 
Sounds great. And then the realist four me, years ago, yeah, <laughs> or, but yeah, right. four years ago, ten, ten years ago now. What, I, what what occurs to me to think, however, we're sitting here in the graduate school of business, is that the north star of every company is to make money. It's to maximize the profit they can make, and that's what the incentive structure is. In addition to the value that's um, put forward, so maybe the you know the current example right now to put on the table about this is Juul. This you know, mm -hmm. vaping product created in the design school here at Stanford with what seemed like a great value proposition. Here was a way to get people off of the carcinogenic properties of tobacco while keeping your nicotine ad addiction and then managing it. And instead, it turns out that over time, they market it to a bunch of teenagers under pineapple and candy cane flavors. And now there's a ton of kids you know, with an epidemic now of vaping. So the, the way I explain that is not that the company either never had a North Star or lost its North Star. The way I explain it is they wanted to crush their competitors into the ground and make a lot of money, and they found a way to do it. So I'm by no means defending that all corporations are saints with halos going, <laughs> with, going at them. And I do think that one of the problems in every area of society is you have the structural incentives that lead to some kinds of corruption. And definitely, uh, while overall, the kind of collection of business and profitability incentives has led to a lot of productivity, a lot of product services, right. jobs, you know, greater prosperity for medicine and all the rest. So, so generally speaking, when people tend to say, well, I'm against capitalism, I think, well, like, sure. you're kind of a fool, right? Now, yep. manage capitalism, yep. right? And like, oh, let's deal with child labor, let's do the other things, sure. those are important. And so, um, so it isn't you know, a panacea to say, just have a mission statement. And you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, businesses that I don't invest in, even though when I look at it and say, okay, that could be a good profitable business where you have an interesting equity thing, because I think it has the wrong impact. Now, I have a privileged place of, I've got a lot of other investments yeah. that make a bunch of money, so I can make that decision, yeah. and it's harder in, in other circumstances. But the, um, uh, you know, so I do think that one of the questions, oh, and then the other thing that, you know this, but, but to say for the audience, there's this kind of question, there's a set of judgments about, yes, you're maximizing prof profitability, but you're also building brand, longevity, long term. Mm -hmm. So there's a set of market incentives about like maintaining trust and, right. and, mm -hmm. and doing things that by, by, by which people say, okay, we think you're good custodians, we like you, and so forth. And, and so a lot of kind of corporate social responsibility programs and other kinds of things going on. So I think it's, when people usually say, you're trying to get every last penny, well, there's some organizations are doing that. Yep. You know, they, uh, part of the function of media and other things is to call that out and make sure that markets respond to that in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, but the, and you know, sometimes government and policies as well. And, um, but, but on the other hand, I actually think that there is also, it, it doesn't mean that when people say things like, look, I, what I'm really trying to do is make the world more open and connected. That is not, they are genuinely trying to do that. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. And it, and the issues are really hard, right? Like, I, I think we are not served well by trying to dumb down the ethical question, sure. right? And so the, the, the North Star is a place for a, a point of reference, as, as a North Star is actually supposed to be, right? But, but it, in the actual application of it, the conversation is nuanced. The factors that you're trading off are difficult. The, the Google Maven question, there were really important con like arguments on both sides of that. Yeah. I think that's also the case with a decision to go into China, right? Like it, it, is, it is an ethical question because it's hard. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the obligation is to have the conversation, yeah. right? And, and maybe in some of these companies, I think part of the, the employee um, uh, revolts in some cases is that that conversation is not being had well internally, is not being had transparently, is not being communicated well, and so you end up with 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 a reaction to it. Um, there are some times where you know executives have to keep things kind of under wraps for for a certain period of time, but you have to at some point be able to explain it. So I think to follow up on that because you make a really good point. I would just throw out an idea to pause it to see what your reaction is. That you know we have these slides that in 10 years there's been these changes in technology and there's a North Star the companies have. And to posit the idea, I would posit that the North Star of these companies did not change, the public perception of their North Star changed. And so at what point does a company actually say what we believe we thought we were doing is not what we're, we're actually doing and maybe we need to change our North Star and communicate that? Does that happen? So I think it almost certainly happens. I mean, one of the ways that I 
look at what's happening with the tech industry is, you know, you kind of start, like in, the, in blitz scaling, I kind of went, it's a transition from being a pirate to a Navy, right? And so it's, you kind of start with your squash buckling and if there's an element of disruption and then you eventually get into a more structured and regulated system. And ultimately, part of what's happening is these companies are, are moving with a stunning pace towards being part of social infrastructure, yeah. being charged in uh, 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 this kind of infrastructure. And then that now adds society as a customer too. Right, or as a stakeholder at the very least. And so was, look, the thing that I was trying to encourage with some of the stuff I put in the book and some of the blog, the um, podcast, Masters of Scale, and the, and the, and the uh, blog posts, was to say, as you get to a massive scale, you start thinking about, okay, what is, what is, what is my intentionality around social responsibility? Yeah. And, and you know, for example, take something less uh, charged than you know, the questions of, you know, filter bubbles and so forth, you do have like this kind of issue around like, okay, so frequently a lot of online spaces are not really safe for women. You know, okay, what do you do about that? That's not okay, that has to be fixed, mm -hmm. right? And once your social infrastructure and there's like everybody's there, you've got the whole range, right? So you need to figure out how to make it a, a better uh, clean and well-lit space in, in, in all the spaces that are important to go as one of the citizens. And I think that's, that now beginning to think of we have responsibility not just to our individual customers who are showing us by their choices and behaviors and also, but also yeah. to society. Yeah. Jim. So Reed's book is called Blitzscaling and I want to put sort of Nicole on the spot a bit. Uh, you know, she drove down from Berkeley today um, <laughs> and she has been sort of recorded in a podcast making the case for a slow food movement for technology, right, as an alternative to the blitzscaling approach. That is- I'm that artisanal gardener from Berkeley. <laughs> right. Um, and I, I want you to talk about where that argument is coming from, how you think it's different than the get out there, break things and iterate sort of mentality that we have with technology, disrupt and then adapt. Um, what does it mean to go slow? And when should we go slow versus go fast? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, so that the conversation that I was having around shouldn't we maybe have a slow food movement for the internet, um, was actually with, with Kara Swisher. And, and the context of it was Russian disinformation um, and sort of the poisoning of a lot of social platforms um, with <coughs> content that's just coming at us too fast. Um, so let me back up a little bit and sort of regurgitate that conversation. Um, what I was trying to talk about were like, what are the values that we're embedding in these social platforms that we build, um, or, or any platforms that we build. So I, I start with the model of when I was at Google, I started at Google in 2004, the only thing we had was search, which is kind of a, an amazing thing. Like, remember when Google was just like a box on, with a blue page? Um, and, and the pillars of search, the design elements of search were comprehensiveness, relevance, and speed. So comprehensiveness, we wanted all the content we could find on the internet so that we could fill the library. Relevance meant we would understand the question you were asking so that we could deliver the relevant result to you that would answer your question. And speed, because we knew that we would keep you going to more places, getting you better react responses if we could just speed up the way we deliver the, 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 uh, the results. Around 2005, six, seven, um, we had acquired YouTube um, the social graph, the social networks were sort of on the rise. Uh, behavioral advertising, the targeting of advertising based on who you are, where you look on the web, what you, what you seem to be interested in started to, be, to grow. And so the pillars of how we build these platforms, the, the metrics of our success changed from comprehensiveness, relevance, speed to engagement. Can I keep you here? Can I make you stay and watch more things or, or click through more pages? Um, personalization, not deliver you the relevant thing, but deliver you more of the things you like um, and speed. And we were still on speed. And to me, the, the, those elements of engagement and personalization is the rocket fuel of all of those outrageous tweets and Facebook posts and YouTube and videos that just 
tunnel through your day and like make you lose time as you're sitting on the internet. Um, and in, as some sociologists are arguing, radicalize certain people into certain po more, even more polarized positions. So when I was talking about, should we slow this down? Right? What if we decide those are not the pillars I want to live with? Um, that the type of platform I want to sit on is one that values content which is authentic. Not that I need to know exactly who the author is, but like at least I knew it came out of 4chan originally, or, or Breitbart, as opposed to the New York Times. Just what is its provenance? So authenticity, accuracy by some metric, and the context of, of how to understand a piece of content. If I value that, um, how, how do we design for that, right? Can I take the ads optimization team that is doing so much for Facebook and Twitter and, and, and YouTube and port them over to that particular task for a little while? Because mm -hmm. um, what would we end up with then? Mm -hmm. um, so that was the concept of like, can we get away from the models that we're doing right now, which are so, um, viral, built on virality and, and uh, sort of this, this high speed motion and, and create a place where you could have, my friend Jeff Rosen uh, at the National Constitution Center, a Madisonian moment of, of reasoned public discourse. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, but so you were there at that founding moment, right? And I don't know if you would characterize the shift from you know, relevance and comprehensiveness and speed to uh, you know, engagement, um, personalization and speed as a change in the North Star of Google, uh, an evolution in a slightly new direction. But if you're willing, tell us a little bit about what kinds of debates went into that direction. Was there any anticipation potentially of the consequences of moving in this direction for the quality, the authenticity, the things that you're saying we ought to have approached this more slowly and thought about it. Were these things actually weighed in some serious way and, and the consequences anticipated and some judgment made by somebody that this was the right direction to go and for what reasons? So my recollection of it, and it's been a number of years at this point, um, is that it was too early to tell, right? Like we didn't know what person... Personalization felt like the right thing. Personalization felt like a, a, a companion to relevance in a bunch of ways, right? Which is like, hey, if I know that you typed in BASS, but I also know that you really enjoy fishing and not guitar playing, I'm gonna deliver you search results that are more personalized to you, right? And therefore more relevant. And, and I think engagement seemed to feel like, hey, if they're engaged, if we're measuring how much time they're spending with us, that feels like they're giving us some love, right? That feels like we must be doing the right thing because they're still here. And I think in the original conception of, of shifting those design pillars, which are not North Stars, I think, but, but design pillars, I, I think that, that it felt like it was aligned with the mission still. And it was not until we got to scale, right, that the detriment of it arose. I also think, honestly, like, I still believe in a free and open internet. I'm, I'm an optimist as well. Mm. Um, and I don't, what I, what I feel naive about is that we were gonna get exploited for believing in a free and open internet, uh -huh. right? That, that we would be weaponized um, by allowing our platforms to be broadly available. Um, and, and, I, and we didn't prepare for those defenses at all. Because yeah. look, when you get to society and infrastructure, same reason we have laws, we have, police forces, we have a bunch of things. And as you get to infrastructure, you have to realize it is a different game that you're playing. And that's actually part of what I think everybody's been learning in the last, you know, kind of five-ish years um, for this. And I think that's the, the, like, there's a subtle thing that's really important and kind of one of the reasons it's great you guys are teaching this class, um, part of the reason, you know, agreed to be here, is that the, 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 the subtlety is a lot of this stuff actually happens. One, as Nicole says, you can't predict it in advance. That's part of the reason I tend to be a fan for experiment, measure, refactor, right? As opposed to try to plan it all out in the beginning because you just don't know where it's going to go and as you get to this infrastructure. But the second thing is it's these subtleties around what happens when you're a product manager managing to a dashboard and to a number. And part of the thing that we need in kind of 
uh, you know, within the profession of product managers, program managers, engineers, and so forth, say, okay, look, we are maximizing numbers because you maximize engagement, you maximize revenue, and so forth. That's the natural function. Actually, in fact, yeah. I kind of wish more government systems had dashboards they were running, <laughs> sure. you know, efficiency and targets on. <laughs> um, but also to realize that those those can mislead you in some bad ways. So you say, oh, how do I get more clicks? Well, actually, what, maybe what I'm trying to do is get you more outraged. And actually, when you think of society as a customer, we actually don't want more and more people to be outraged. And so we should figure out how to get more clicks without using that you know, and kind of tuning which numbers you're actually looking for. And, and it isn't really necessarily a, a plot from the company. Usually it's unintentional. And usually it's kind of unintentional through product managers going, oh, my, my job is to, to increase you know, monthly engagement by 5%. That's, that, that's what I've been tasked to do. And you go, okay, yes, that's good to do, but do so with some thought to what the broader context is as you move into infrastructure and you're part of society, and, and that's part of it too as you get there. But let's push on this one just a little bit because maybe you can give a concrete example. Because I like the idea that as these companies have grown, become global, they constitute social infrastructure. Yes. And at that scale, then society becomes, as it were, a customer yeah. too. There's an obligation there. All right, so the product manager, the developer mm -hmm. working into the product manager has a dashboard that's giving all kinds of indicators on, yeah. you know, a marginal improvement on time on platform yeah. or whatever it turns out yes. to be. What's the dashboard look like at the product manager level for the social infrastructure? Well, so I think part of the things that you look at is you say, okay, and by the way, part of what um, these platforms need is some moral legitimacy and guidance from society. Because remember yeah. when, when some engi Facebook engineers ran some experiments about we, bet, we think we can make you happy or depressed. Yeah, that didn't go well. It was outrage about, <laughs> you're manipulating us. Right. right. But part of what you're saying is say, well, we'd like to have less hatred. We'd like to have less, e.g., e we'd like you to go back to those experiments you're doing yeah. but tune them in this way. So yeah. they need some, some guidance from society to say, yeah. look, we'd like you to take things because you can use you know, modern AI techniques to do sentiment analysis. And if what you're doing is you know, kind of versions of, of aggression speech and all kinds of, we'd like you to tune down how much, that, we'd like you to have on your dashboard what the sharing and the volume, the percentage and the volume is, and we'd like you to tune that down. We'd like you to make it a, a little less shared. Like maybe to share that one requires 1,000 likes versus, yeah. versus 500 likes. Right. And you kind of tune in that way. While you're still trying to get engagement up, you're now trying to make it maybe slower. I'm not sure slow <laughs> would be the word I'd use. Yeah. <laughs> right. But you're, you're trying to make it more civil. Yep. Right, in terms of, and, but they need the guidance for doing that because precisely one of the reasons why they tend to retreat to saying, hey, look, we're just doing the simple algorithm is they don't want to be accused of trying to manipulate. Right. Right, and, and so what we're, but what we're saying is what we need as a society is we actually do want you to manipulate in certain ways that we think is better off for society. Now, that then returns us back to, okay, who is well organized to say that? Who has the competencies for doing that? Yeah, you know, now, well, now, uh, now we're getting into it. <laughs> well, which Sorry, gets into your operational yeah. question of like, I'm understanding our, your class is like two thirds CS and then the other third of you. I don't know who you are. I am an American <laughs> studies major, yeah. an English minor, a poetry fellow. I have like every Ooh. liberal arts card stacked against me right now. But maybe we need more of us at the table, yeah. right? Like, so when you design your business, when you design your product, you need more ethicists, anthropologists, people who are filtering ideas to you about not just is there a good product market fit, but is there a good societal yeah. fit? Well, but more specifically though, to do that, you also need to either, that's part of the reason I was earlier advocating values, because you could say, look, join the platform or not, here's what our values are, so free to market of choice. But if you're now going to, 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 to uh, refactor after scale, yeah. you do need to have some kind of, uh, of, an, of, of permission or encouragement from society to so do, right? I mean, it, it doesn't have to be a hard thumb yeah. on the scale, but you say, okay, we'd like, because by the way, you start uh, implementing algorithms like that under a current administration, you'll have Trump saying you're silencing conservatives and a bunch of other things which 
seem to me to be lies, but fine, <laughs> right? And, and that's the challenge that you end up getting into. So you need something to, to navigate, some framework in which to navigate yeah. that. So from there. the technology standpoint, to kind of follow up on what you're both saying, and I totally like that you made the point that we need more than technologists at the table, but putting on my technologist <laughs> hat, right, is that notion of when you want to experiment and measure and refactor and you optimize, one of the big questions is what are you optimizing? Right. And so, you know, as an example, back in the early days of Google, we shared a little time there. There was this article and some reporters would call where they said, you know, there's this Facebook thing and the users of Facebook spend more time on that platform than they do at Google. What are you going to do about it? And the answer was nothing because you want people to find their search results yep. and go somewhere else. Yep. So the objective function you wanted to optimize was a different objective function. And so as you're thinking about this kind of iteration or the kinds of things you can bring from the standpoint of we're not just maximizing click-through, we're not just maximizing for revenue, how do you work those other things into a quantitative function that you can measure and optimize over time? But that was like the, one of the metrics for Google yeah, search, right? Exactly. right? Like how, many, how often are we sending them away mm -hmm. was, was the metric of success. And I think that that, again, like it, it's, your North Star is determined so much by what is, it the what is the thing you're trying to accomplish as a product? Mm -hmm. Jeremy. So, so I love this, uh, you know, read this idea of there ought to be some moral legitimacy and guidance from society that shapes what's being optimized by companies. I'd, like, a happy place. I'd like to go to this world <laughs> that, that you imagine exists somewhere in some science fiction novel that hasn't yet been passed on to me. And, we and gotta I think, get you out of your Twitter stream more often. <laughs> I, I think we should come to the question of, of uh, and, and we will in a minute, how society would actually come to those views and that will bring us to questions of governance. But before we go to governance, I just want to ask you just to understand your mindset. What about when the company says no, mm -hmm. right? So say society does suggest, you know what? You're, you're tuning this in a direction that clearly benefits your bottom line, uh, but you know what? It's having these kinds of corrosive effects and the company says, you know what? Thanks for letting me know. Um, but, you know, my priority, you know, think about Apple and, and its resistance to the FBI's seeking of access to data on iPhones, you know what? We prioritize encryption, right? We're, we're not, you know, we get that you have some national security concerns, but you're gonna have to work around that. Um, and you won't be able to get, you know, what's on the iPhone because our priority as a company, yeah, we're in the United States, but we're also in Ireland and the Caymans and a bunch of other places. Our priority isn't what your priority is. So just help me understand, the, the company's response to that is not, thanks for letting me know, we're gonna tune that dial in a different direction because as you both suggested, these are not American companies, these are global companies. And as Rob suggested, these are companies that are driven by a bottom line. So who's tuning? Who, who's responsive to this moral guidance that comes from the thing we call society? So typically it's multiple stakeholders. So look, the, one of the things that people, you know, uh, if they don't understand about these tech companies, of which you know, a stunning number of them are based within about 30 miles of where we're sitting right now, um, is that the, more of their customers are outside of the U.S. than inside, more of their revenues are outside the U.S. than inside. Uh, the U.S. actually benefits a lot from that in terms of, of driving in revenues, of setting platforms and norms to the rest of the world, but that's the, the, the truth of it needs to factor that in. And I think sometimes there's conflict because the, the society will say, well, we think you should do X, and companies say, no, we shouldn't. Now, ultimately, I think the, the, it's the well-ordered dem democratic society that I believe in that you say you're responsive to. That's part of the reason I gave the earlier answer on military yeah. uh, the way I did. Um, but I also think that it's okay for the company to kind of stand up for it and try to push for it. So like on the encryption topic, I actually thought the FBI stance was wrong. Um, I thought the, the question about uh, it isn't like well-ordered society uh, versus um, like kind of like, you know, um, uh, you know like with the, with the encryption keys versus that. Actually encryption makes the whole system safe. And, and I think they were taking a, oh, well, because we, it makes our specific task job easier, we want to break the system the following ways. That would actually cause a lot more systemic harm, and I thought they were being fools in what they were asking for. So I was on the Apple side of that, for that part of thing, but you need to have a process to work that out. Now, ultimately, part of it is we live in a democracy. We're accountable to the rules and, and the side of a government. And you know, eventually you 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 get in line with that. That's the that's the the ultimate answer to that. Now, I 
would hope that that process ends up more often with good outputs. Sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes you have to really work on it. Well, and so the Apple situation resolved itself because they found a way to hack it, right? But the ultimate, if that had not happened, it's possible somebody's going to jail. And that is, that is <laughs> my job as the lawyer in some of these companies, like, bottom line, nobody goes to jail on my watch. Like, that's a really important, like, <laughs> professional <laughs> line. That's nobody goes to jail function. on my watch. Yeah. Um, but but that's, that, that is a thing that you have to advise your company of, that this is one of the dangers. We can take a stand on principle. Um, and, but at the end of the day, my experience is governments usually win because they have law enforcement. I refer to that as the orange jumpsuit problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, it does raise, sorry, go ahead, Hillary. Um, so just because Reed has invited it a couple of different times, this notion of a well-ordered democracy, and, and uh, you know, it's something that we should probably talk about. And it's, aspire we could, to. Aspire to. We <laughs> yes. can talk about it on a couple of different levels, though. We can talk about, you know, is our current democracy well-ordered, especially with respect to governance over technology? And then we could talk about the more sort of theoretical but also geopolitical element of it, which is, you know, democracy might actually be better served by technology that has some of the values that would be espoused in the slow food movement, right? By privileging accuracy and some friction, not just always privileging speed and efficiency. And so you, you could argue that actually technology and being weaponized against democracy is because it actually tends towards non-democratic um, sort of qualities like uh, outrage and efficiency and speed and that sort of thing, which aren't fundamental to democracy. So when we think about you know, the, the geopolitical arms race that's going on in not just technology company versus technology company, but democracy versus other sorts of governments, you know, what role is technology playing in that fight? And you know, to what extent are we distracting ourselves talking about having values and ethics when we're up against you know, some other actors that maybe aren't having that same conversation at the same level. One nuance on the question is, that was the reason I was using well-ordered democracy. Democracy is actually pretty messy. Uh, you know, people have been slandering each other and lying in politics for as long as <laughs> democracy and other forms of government have existed. So, but what we do want is we want to say, what's really important, like part of what so disheartens me about the last couple of years is, we want truth telling. We want to be able to say, look, we're learning, we're reasoning, we're getting to the right outcomes because we're, we're talking to it the right way. And clearly, part of what we have is a increasing breakdown in truth discourse. Now, people then say, well, it's Facebook's fault. And you go, well, actually, in fact, there's, there's cable news, there's, right. there's you know, Sinclair, there's, there's a whole stack of things, you know, talk radio that go into this that it's been kind of building towards uh, that perhaps filter bubbles in social networks then amplify. But um, I think that the question is to say, well, no, actually what we should be doing is figuring out how do we get back to we're actually having truth-based discourse. So that part of this, again, I'm not sure I use the word slow, yeah. but where the, the, the system is, whether it's provenance of where did this come from, if it's a question of you know, did, the, did this uh, source of information sign up for a kind of a journalist integrity pledge that they take some legal liability for that's behind it so they're asserting it in some way that they're taking accountability for what they're asserting you know those kinds of things I think are a part of what we want to be heading towards um, and uh, you know uh, I had a lot of uh, I think there were a lot of smart people trying to work on this and improve it in the last administration and I don't think there's very many of them who are hired in the current administration, which is one of the reasons why uh, in 2016 I you know, made these trumped up cards as part of mocking the absurdity of the, the system. Anyway, or sort of the candidacy. But so I think, that the, um, I think that the really key thing is to try to figure out how do we get to this, here is how we can articulate what we're targeting as a society, and then the way that I would approach the the companies is not, oh, we as Congress people are better product designers than you. You'll tend to do the wrong thing. You'll tend to enshrine the past against the future. But we come to you and say, we want you to solve this problem. And our threat is, we'll regulate if you don't solve this problem. So start bringing us solutions and have a dialogue. That, that's what I think a good process would be if we could get there. 
But I mean, take it, you know, I want to bring Nicole into this conversation because she made the probably surprising choice to many of her colleagues of saying, you know what, I'm going to leave this mecca of Silicon Valley, uh, the great hiking that exists here, uh, access the to the ski slopes, uh, artisanal, you know, cuisine in Berkeley, and I'm going to move to Washington, D.C. You did that, you know, in 2013 to look at this from the government side. I'm interested in what you encountered when you got there. Uh, what did what did you make of that universe that you hadn't operated in? How did you see that universe grappling with the power of technology companies and the need uh, to catch up with them uh, as sort of the pace of technological change outpaced what the policymakers were confronting? Uh, what did it look like from the inside? <laughs> A mess. Laws and sausages. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay, let me start with the like, privilege of my life to have served in the Obama administration and to, to work on issues of science and technology, unquestionably. Um, but it's crazy in there, and probably even more so right now. Um, here's the thing, and, and I, wanna, I wanna bucket the conversation around our government and democracy and technology in two places. One is just like, technology brought into government, which was one of the focuses when I was working um, in the office of the chief technologist's office, is like, we should up-level our government. We have the best um, technology companies in the world, and we still have trouble getting social security checks out, right? So like, slow food movement does not apply for me in the delivery of government services. If you can get a chocolate cake from Amazon in two hours, you ought to be able to get your social security benefits and your IRS check and everything else in just the same amount of time, right? Without taking a day off from work. So, so the, one of the projects of technology and government is that we should improve our delivery of government services using all of the power that we have as, as a really technologically sophisticated country. Um, so that, that's one project for us in a democracy, perhaps the next administration, because it's mm. not gonna happen in this administration. Mm. Um, the other one is the policy angle, which is like wh who's making policies that decide how technology is governed within our country. Um, and if you watch the hearings like with Mark Zuckerberg or any of the other tech executives that had to go testify about terrorism and Cambridge Analytica and all this, like you were appalled, right? About the level of education that our policymakers have about how the internet works. We should do better than that um, because we cannot get good policy if we are not actually dealing with the right questions and the right issues. Um, Here's what that means. We need to go serve, all of us. And I don't care if it means you're manning a polling station or taking time off for your job for six months to go work in government or taking two years, which is what I had, I had done. Like, we need, this government is just us, so if we are not in, it will move ahead without us. We need to go and serve and make it better. Um, and because we will not get to the right answers without all of us contributing to that. So, so this is a question actually on, on that very message. So if I'm trying to inhabit the perspective of a senior who's graduating from Stanford this year, and I've, you know, I've been civically educated, so I believe in the power of service, but I actually look at the realities of what will my life look like if I go work in the bowels of some government agency, even working on issues of technology and science, or I go work as an entry-level person at a tech company where, like you said, you know, free food, um, <laughs> amenities aplenty, et cetera, et cetera, massages good news, yes. massages, <laughs> you know, how, how am I um, in any reasonable way supposed to make that decision? Yeah, no, I mean, well, so part of it's on us, right, which is, and I think in the time that I was there, there was a huge amount of inspiration around doing that, around making sure that veterans were getting their benefits on time, and around um, making sure that people could sign up for healthcare.gov. Remember healthcare.gov? Is that just one lifetime ago? Because it feels like it, right, like making sure websites work properly. Um, and I know it doesn't sound like the most glamorous thing in the world, and there are no massages that come with it, but it's your, the scale of your impact is you will improve the lives of millions of people. Millions. Um, and that's a gift to be able to do, right? 
I want to offer a, a version of an answer to that question too, Hillary, because you know, one of the things that I think about, you know, if you cycle back in time 25, 30 years to when I was graduating from college, I was an early part of the Teach for America core member uh, through Teach for America organization. And all the things you just said about government, any graduating senior would have said about going to work in a, in a, in a, as a fifth grade teacher in a public schoolhouse. And Teach for America nowadays, like Code for America, is trying to rebrand this as a civic mission and, and can have some success at doing so. And, and then I want to emphasize this scale, the scale of your impact. Like, you know, there was never any time where I went to bed at night being a sixth grade teacher where I wondered, am I doing anything here that's worthwhile? Is this a valuable thing for me to be spending my time doing? Whereas by contrast, even though if I could get a massage and eat some nice food as a run-of-the-mill person in a large tech company, well, I haven't done it, so I don't, I don't know this to be the, the case. But I might imagine having questions like, am I an essential contributor here? Is this company going to go well without me? Whereas I knew if I, if I felt sick tomorrow and didn't show up, the 35 kids in my class were going to be worse off for it. And that made a difference, and I think could make a difference to think about technology. And that's the scale issue. Like, one more thing about this, because I think this is so important for anybody who's a student. One of the things I find mystifying about Stanford University students is the idea that there's a kind of halo over nonprofit organizations, which indeed contribute a lot of good. I have nothing against nonprofit organizations. But compared to the opportunity to go work in a government office, say. So you know, Stanford has summer internships and postgraduate placements to go work in Sacramento in the state government, you know, the, the legislature, the governor's office. And then they have summer placements and postgraduate opportunities to go work in like a, an environmental nonprofit in Oakland with a budget of $150,000 a year. And there are 25 people right. who apply for the small, tiny in Oakland nonprofit organization, and three people who apply to go work in the governor's office of the fifth largest economy in the whole world. <laughs> and you wonder, what are the seniors thinking? <laughs> why, why make that choice? It, it must be how they're taught. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it must well, be. well said, Reed. I, I also think so, um, not to put it all on the students, right? Like, I think also government needs to meet the, right. meet the challenge of providing the opportunity. So I'm going to do a pitch for my friends who are still in DC. Mm. US Digital Services is yeah. accepting applications now. You can go and embed in any one of these agencies and start to help making people's lives better. Um, they, they are there to deliver services, and, and they're nonpartisan. Um, the, the, but we, that, those are usually two to four year commitments. And I get it. Like, if you can make 300 grand as a cybersecurity expert in a private company, that may not sound so great. But there are also things like the Presidential Innovation Fellows, where you could do it for six months to a year. So my feeling is, both at the federal level, but also at the state and the local levels, we need to be creating opportunities for people to cycle in in kind of like a Peace Corps, right. AmeriCorps Teach kind of America way, way, right? Yeah. Like, you don't have to do it for a lifetime, but you should be able to do it for some period yeah. of your career yeah. because it will benefit everybody. All right. One more thing in this, and we move on to the new topic. Go ahead. So, uh, so I, I want to take us back to these two lenses on government uh, that you gave us. So one was uh, sort of, you know, we ought to be able to do the things in government that the private sector can do as quickly and as efficiently. You know, the, the example I always give is when I got to the White House for the first time, I turned on my computer, I had Microsoft 1997, <laughs> right? And this was 2009, right? And, and I'm a social scientist here. Someone asked me to do some data work. I couldn't even find Excel or a statistics program on any of these computers. And so, you know, there, there is a way in which that is undoubtedly low-hanging fruit uh, where the returns are potentially high to bringing in this expertise. But, but let's go to the issues actually where there's a lot of disagreement. And I, I want to come back to encryption uh, because, of course, you know, Reed self-identified as being on the side of Apple uh, as they were fighting this case against the FBI. You thought James Comey was on the wrong side. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the Situation Room in the midst of these encryption debates. Um, and, and, and Nicole, you obviously were a part of the community of technologists inside government who were there wearing not only the hat of, of, of the sort of US government at that point, uh, but also having brought the experience of being on the technology side and really understanding the core issues that were at stake in encryption. Now, Reed, what you said is that what government ought to have done was gone to the technology companies and said, look, if you don't figure this out, we have a set of needs. So if you don't figure this out, like bad things are coming, 
right? And that's often what we talked about in the Situation Room. We said, look, in, in the event that we can't figure out a detente with the technology companies around access to data that enables us to meet the national security objectives that are our primary goal, right? The president thinking about, I'm elected to keep the people of the United States safe from terrorist risk. And the fact that I can't access information on phones in the context of an investigation to find out whether the shooter in San Bernardino is connected with other people in the Los Angeles area who might, in fact, be associated with potential future threats. That's the president's primary responsibility. We took that message to the technology companies, right? But they're actually competing values at stake here. And I often would use the example of the Patriot Act out there. And I'd say, look, we can see what happens in the midst of a crisis. And, and we can turn to our great and venerable institution of Congress, as well-functioning as it is, and we can ask them over the course of a week or two to write the regulations that we need to balance the equities in the moment of crisis. But obviously we know that that's not the best outcome. That's not the way to handle these issues. So before we come back to read on, on sort of why that strategy that you described just didn't work on the encryption front, because we ended up in court, right? And, and, and the phone was able to be hacked before it went up to the highest court in the land where I, I think Apple probably would have lost, mm -hmm. uh, as Nicole suggested. But Nicole, tell me how you wore these two hats, or at least carried the backpack of experience, <laughs> but then were responsible for the US government. Like, like how do you even navigate that? That's a, that's a conversation where there might be two things that are fundamentally incompatible. The notion that encryption is good for all in some fundamental sense if we can achieve it, but there's a trade-off with respect to the primary responsibility of the United States government to keep Americans safe. So here's the thing about working in government. One, you have to learn a bazillion acronyms. I had two pages of single-spaced acronyms because I just couldn't keep track. That was one thing. The other thing I learned in government is like people have equities, which means like you represent a set of interests and you come to the table representing that set of interests. So I had I have been in the situation room with some of those national security issues and the 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 equities that I was there to represent were the technology landscape, not just the companies, but like the health of the internet and technology in general. And that's what I did, because some, someone from national security, maybe you, was gonna argue the other side of that, right? But like, I was there to say like, here is going to be the impact on the companies, on how we look at technology going forward. And I think, and I'm gonna go into the substance for just a minute, which is I'm, I, I get somewhat frustrated in those national conversations, not just in our country, by the way, but like in lots of different countries that are trying to protect, usually it's their national security interests or whatever their interests are, trying to think about the issue just through the narrow lens of their country. When these are global platforms, and if you change it for one country, you're changing it for all countries. So this is at the heart of the encryption debate, which is like, I create a backdoor for you. That backdoor exists for China and Russia and Turkey and Saudi Arabia too. And I cannot close the door. And so I think that that, but, but so that was my job, is to say those words, right? To, to make sure that they understood not just narrowly what is the national security interest for the United States, but broadly what will that mean in terms of all the other dimensions of how the technology will change. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing on that specific case was that was very much driven by ego. I called two of my hacker friends when they came up, and they said in a day I could get into it. So I was like, no, 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 we want to call public Apple publicly on the mat. We want to say that we have access to these kinds of technologies. We can force these companies to do this in a public way, which is not necessarily good for the safety and security of the system, not necessarily good because actually encryption also protects your data, protects financial transactions, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I want to do this in this public way, and that's part of the reason I disagreed with that specific thing. If you have the physical device in front of you, there's a whole bunch of things you could do. And I validated that by calling two of my friends, like, yeah, yeah, it'll take me about a day. And they eventually hired the Israeli company that did exactly that, you know, after all the storm and drone. Yeah, but I guess, I mean, I, I don't want to, to sort of push this too long, but that's still kind of sidestepping the core issue that's at play, which is that we may have some fundamental incompatibilities mm -hmm. with respect to what's valued. Um, and so ultimately, you know, Nicole, as you know, this representation of equities that happens inside government 
is this effort in some sort of process to come to terms with those incompatible goals, right? Right, so the government has to have its North Star, right, which is where its priorities lie. And, and in some cases, it will be for the national security issues. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that will come at a cost in some cases around whether we continue to have a free and open internet and what that looks like. Um, so uh, this is a slightly different conversation than encryption, so sorry. Um, but I was struck by um, the questions that were asked of tech executives around why aren't you doing more to prevent terrorist content on your sites? Um, and there was a lot of talk in those, in, like the senators were asking things like, why aren't you just like verifying the identity of all these people? Or how come you can't just wipe out anything that's coming from ISIS? Um, and, and I was reflecting back because 10 years ago, I was testifying before the same committee, the Senate Judiciary Committee, about like, why were we sitting in China where they demand that you va verify the users and their identity, because they might go do something terrible to them. Why, why would you go into China and censor broadly based on these keywords that they tell you to censor on? They were the same question. It's the same technology, right? It's just from a different lens. And so I think we, we as technologists need to be really clear with policymakers about the choices that they make and that those choices are not isolated to just the immediate question, that we build for global and we build for the long term in a lot of cases. Look, and to be super clear, ultimately, you might protest laws, you may take them into lawsuits, you may do other things, but you obey the laws of the society you're in unless those laws are like, oh, we're creating concentration camps and so forth, and then you're in a different kind of problem, right? So, <coughs> so you, you know, so ultimately you're there, but there's a lot, of pro a lot of different ways by which that dialogue works. So we've got about 15 minutes left, and, and um, some of the questions we got from the folks in, in the audience, I want to make sure we get into the conversation. A bunch of them have been part of what we've been talking about here. And I want to just cycle back a little bit on the topic that started us down for the past half hour of this very conversation, which had to do with the well-ordered democracy and the kinds of obligations that a global company has to the, either the liberal democratic norms of a set of <coughs> countries or the particular country in which they're lodged. So, um, you know, we started with um, this idea that, you know, I, I started off the whole conversation by quoting um, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush about how, you know, the uh, David of the um, uh, microchip would defeat the Goliath of totalitarianism. And um, then Hillary, in her opening comments, talked about this Yuval Harari bit about, you know, the, the most significant force in the world today is here in Silicon Valley. It's how technology evolves. You know, Harari, in his most recent book, has made the claim that technology now favors tyranny, favors authoritarianism, because the, the quantity that's of an, the greatest value right now is big data. Um, that's where the centralized insights, especially with AI, are going to be extracted. And in a centralized authoritarian regime, that's where the ocean of data can be manipulated, not just for the profit-maximizing interests of the company, but for the political interests of an authoritarian country. So take this encryption debate. Let's assume that if this entire thing had happened in China with a Chinese-made cell phone and a Chinese company, it would have been less than 24 hours before the Chinese government had the information on the phone. Let's, I, I would hazard to guess. So let's take a big picture take at this right now, which is, A, do you believe, as Harari now suggests, that in an, in an AI-driven future, mm -hmm that technology favors tyranny, <coughs> or, or that's a pro provocative um, um, description. Let's just call it AI and technology related to it favors centralized authoritarian governance. And we get a geopolitical question about whether the decentralized divided government and you know, a firewall between the interests of private companies and the government and, and democracies is now a liability. Um, that's one big question. If you don't want to tackle that one, then let's just go to the <laughs> geopolitical question about if we have an arms race now in AI between the United States and China, and how is that going to play out? <laughs> Two easy questions. Yeah. Um, so uh, what is the answer? 42? Yeah. The, um, so on the, on the first one, I generally think that uh, technology does tend to create 
tend to, towards a little bit more centralization of power broadly, and especially in the recent context. Maybe it's the all thousands of years, yeah. but maybe intensified. But that's also similar, like television did that too, and yeah. you know these kinds of things. And that's part of the reason why trying to figure out how to have a well-ordered society and, 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 and have that play the right role, and part of the reason why you know, I'm, a, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a big fan of, of, of well-ordered democracies, um, of which you know, maybe uh, Canada uh, is, um, <laughs> is, is, is a leading light of. And so, um, and so I think that that is true as a tendency is that technologies do create uh, different loci of power, uh, different um, uh, uh, shifts in society, shifts between nations uh, and whatnot. And I think that's one of the reasons why part of what we're trying to do as a society and part of the moral responsibility of inventors and founders and everything else is trying to say, look, it's not just the, oh yeah, government does it, but we all try to, should try to shape that in, yeah. some, in some useful way. Now, part of the reason why um, I think that the thing that people have to realize, and that's an earlier kind of the GDP, um, uh, PR and, and kind of Europe and US and then uh, you know China and other places is, um, if I understand human societies, they're, they're kind of, human tribes compete with each other. Right. And if you say, okay, well, we're not gonna do that anymore, or we're gonna really slow down, then you know, a lot of this competition, speed is almost always in, a factor in competition. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the, the, the things that I uh, uh, remember is, uh, for many, many years, when I'd go any place from here, from the Silicon Valley, I'd go somewhere else, and I'd go, oh, you guys look like you're moving in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And I'd go into China, mm -hmm. and i go, oh, we're moving in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, concerning from a viewpoint of, of how that uh, plays out. And so I think the, the question you have to ask is, look, we do need to get to the right outcomes, but you also need to be competitive and getting there and making it happen. And that's part of the reason to say, well, think very carefully about where you impose rules to ask for permission versus ask for forgiveness, because if you can do the forgiveness, you can still refactor and do them, and you can still operate at speed in terms of getting there. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the fact that we do live in a globally competitive world that's actually heading much more to a multipolar world uh -huh. now is something that needs to factor into our thinking on these questions. Mm -hmm. So um, to put something concrete in this, I mean, yeah. assume one of the implications of this view of, you know, we, we're, we're competing in a multipolar world, the technology has to develop quickly, else we'll be, uh, you know, uh, um, quickly Silicon yeah. Valley's ad advantage will, will be superseded elsewhere. So when people raise the topic now of antitrust in the United States, that mm -hmm. part of the problem of the power of these enormous American technology companies is that they're so centralized and competition is so difficult, at least within the US context, you're skeptical of an antitrust approach. Well, well by the way, just one challenge. I am skeptical of an antitrust approach, as you know, since we've talked about yes. this before. Um, <laughs> but the, um, specifically, by the way, on competition, I actually think you know, we're growing to more and more large tech companies that are actually competing with each other. Yeah. And the competition of them is actually, in fact, fairly fierce. And that competition actually does create some market accountability, does create room for startups, does do that. It's, it's not the monopoly in which the old, this old thing is shutting it all down. Mm -hmm. These companies are actually in fairly fierce competition with each other. Uh, generally speaking, there's a lot of benefits that come from that. Yeah. And so, but the problem is you say, okay, well, let's take you know, a social network and let's now break it up. It's like, oh, well, do you want those social networks to be a different country's social networks, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to get to a certain size and scale for these things. And so that's part of the reason why my, my view of the antitrust hammer being the, the, the tool that we should use is I tend to think that will actually cause us a lot of harm. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the reason why the, the, what, I, what I have recommended when people ask me about this is say, look, we'll try to figure out what, kind, like what, what would you be trying to tune the system to? Would it be truth seeking in the discourse? Would it be less hostility in the interactions? Yeah. Would it be a slower mode of interaction? Try to quantify that in some way and then work and saying, okay, present us your solutions about how you could do that, mm -hmm. you know, operating in the context. And if you don't present good solutions, 
you know, eventually we'll get agitated and we'll do something that is probably a suboptimal solution for all of us. But that would be the, the process by which they do that. And I don't think antitrust is the right tool. Is the right so direction. Can I push on that for a little bit? So you could think of, you know, antitrust from the standpoint of capital concentration. Mm -hmm. And so if you think of, you know, the modern day, you could think of data concentration. Mm -hmm. And so data concentration, when you get to particular thresholds, just become really difficult for someone else to overcome, right? You could argue Amazon is not a website or even delivery company, it's a data company. Mm -hmm. And no one else will be able to compete with them because of the volume of data that they have. When do you see that notion of the data itself becoming the intrinsic competitive advantage that says at this point there is no opportunity for competition because the data has passed the threshold that no one else will be able to catch? Well, mm -hmm. the question is if there's more and more large, um, larger tech companies that are competing with each other, then that's kind of the, the counter. So like, you know, Google is competing with Amazon, right? Uh, you know, uh, part of the thing I think is interesting about all the investment I've been doing in autonomous vehicles is the benefit from that infrastructure, which is one of the things. Like, I don't think the thing that actually locks in some of the Amazon position is this, oh, um, you know, I like to buy you know, kind of 1980s science fiction novels, and they know that. I don't think that's the thing that, that, that's, that's uh, locking it in as much as all the infrastructure, and as that infrastructure changes, and you're actually seeing a lot of really interesting startups doing that. You're seeing a lot of different companies going at that. And so I tend to go, if the competition is genuinely collapsing, then I go back to the, the kind of the antitrust model, mm -hmm. saying, no, no, you gotta break it apart. If the competition is expanding and they're competing in, intensely with each other, then I tend to think it's other tools. For some reason, I'm not taking much solace in the notion that the big companies are competing with each other. And I think I'm, I'm doing this in real time, so apologies. But like, I think it's because I'm not sure they're competing for the right things. Um, so there was, a, a, there was a moment where like, the companies were like, we're going to compete on privacy. Right, and like they, everyone was going to bring out their new privacy tools and their dashboards and their controls for the users, um, and then that fell away. And I don't know how to characterize what they're competing for now, but it doesn't feel like what they're competing for is necessarily in their users' interests. And so, I don't know that competition's getting me there. So let me ask a follow-up question because I think I, I share a little bit of the skepticism of a couple large dominant companies competing with one another. Let's talk about other points of leverage outside of antitrust actions by the state. Um, just how much power do consumers have actually or users to shape the behavior of these companies at this point given their size, scale, and dominance? Just how much power and influence do the workers of these companies have to shape what decisions the C-suite makes about where they draw those lines or how they refashion that North Star. Obviously, this has been a moment where maybe in the context of Delete Uber or the Project Maven stuff that we see at Google, we see both of these communities attempting to exercise some influence. A lot of people less engaged in Facebook perhaps than they were before, turned off by what's happened. On the other hand, where do they go? Uh, what are their alternatives? Why do we not see credible competitors emerging that provide a lot of these do an alternative dominant platform? Likewise with Twitter. As many people as I talk to who hate the content that Twitter makes possible can't live without the Twitterverse with respect to staying in touch with what news or arguments they should pay attention to. So like, is there power outside of the antitrust kinds of actions that Rob described that exists in consumers and users or exists in workers that we think has potential to address some of these negative externalities of the platforms? So I generally think, yes, I mean, Snap launched and so forth, and there's a variety of them. And I think also that as new platforms and new technologies evolve, you know, that changes. Like, you, you know, it used to be like, oh my gosh, you know, Microsoft has the PC platform and now it's like mobile. And that changes all the And so those, we tend to overly enshrine the current moment versus dynamic systems forward. And if anything, I actually think that as opposed, like this is the point, it's not, I'm not saying, oh, it's great, we got three big tech companies and we should be totally happy with that <laughs> in the kind of rhetorical thing. Um, but we're, we're, we got like five moving to 10, moving to 15, and it's moving in that direction. Then I think that opens up. And so that velocity matters. If you say, no, it's five going to two, Okay, that's a, that's a serious problem for us. If it's 
five plus you can see another five in the horizon, plus there's another five after that because part of what I'm, you know, part of what the venture capitalist industry here is doing is trying to figure out those next ones in order to do it. Then actually, in fact, I think that's, that's actually, in fact, broadly a safer place. I don't think they necessarily are always competing in the right things. I think some of them, price, uh, you know, do you trust this service? Does it work for you? I also think you need to add in society as a customer mm -hmm. as you get to the infrastructure uh, parts. But look, there's a reason, look, no system's perfect. The question is which one delivers the overall outcomes in, in the best, in the, in the, in the kind of a, a uh, in, the, in a, a set of imperfect options, which one is the best of the imperfect options? I do feel like there's a policy moment coming, right? For exactly the reason you were talking about. And when I was at the White House, one of the projects I worked on was trying to flesh out the public policy implications of the use of big data. It's called big data. I think it's AI now, that yeah. whatever the current term might be, machine learning generally. Um, and, and we talked to a lot of people about what their concerns around the use of large-scale data sets was going to be. Um, and the thing that was recurring for individuals is this feeling of asymmetry in the power on the control of data, that as an individual, you have so little power compared to the companies that are sucking up the data. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's exacerbated, like consumer facing companies, a LinkedIn, a Yahoo, a, or a, a, a Google, or, or whatever, that's kind of easier to create a dashboard where you can tr control and delete the data or, or whatever, and, and, and that's a little bit easier. But like the data brokers, the axioms of the world, the things that are sitting in the background, where like, you don't even know if they have your data. There's a real sense of powerlessness, I think, for a lot of people. And I think that we're now seeing that conversation happen in terms of the content that we are being fed through news streams, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. And so I, I think that there's, again, sort of this moment of public policy where we have to decide how do we reinvest power with the individuals who are living on these platforms? Um, and I don't have a solution to that, by the way. That's one of the wonderful things of being neither in a company or government is like, I don't know. But it seems like a really important question. Um, and and, and I, this feels like one of those moments. All right, we're near the end of time. And you know, I started us off with a whole bunch of techno-skepticism, techno-dystopianism. And there's always a desire in any public conversation to end on an optimistic note. I generally tend to resist that temptation. <laughs> We're in all going to die. <laughs> in the long run. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to offer my take on that. I'm going to give any, anyone else on stage here a chance to you know, offer a summary comment here. So if, if my memory's right, Churchill is famous for having offered these two famous comments on, on um, American democracy or democracy in general. So the, the one that everyone knows is that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. And I'm pretty sure it was Churchill who also said that the United States can be counted on doing the right thing, although only after first having exhausted all the other options. Yes. <laughs> Those are both Churchill quotes. I think that's a fair thing to say, perhaps, about Silicon Valley tech companies. So American tech companies are the worst form of tech companies except for all the others. And they might be counted on doing the right thing, but only first after having exhausted all the other options. <laughs> Maron. I'm not that pessimistic, <laughs> I would say. I think that the tech, I think I'm actually more with Reed on this, that I think tech companies are populated by a bunch of people that for most intents and purposes actually care about what they're doing. That's otherwise they probably wouldn't be at those companies. And sometimes they make mistakes and sometimes there's externalities for what they do that they don't count on. But I think as a citizenry, as having a free press, I think as having you know government regulation, part of the role of all of that is to try to shine the light on places where Companies need to be able to do better. And in many cases, I think that companies actually try to do better because these issues, the non-tangibles, things like trust and what you believe your long-term impact are really actually impact some of their decision-making. Cool. Um, well, first, thank you for having the class and for inviting me mm -hmm. to you the for coming because it's for been a pleasure. Um, and I think it's so important. <laughs> um, so here's... I don't know if this is optimistic or not. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try and characterize it. <laughs> no one guarantees us a free and open internet. Uh -huh. It is not predestined that that's the way this turns out. So you, in particular, the technologists who are working on it, this is your job. If, if you've decided that those are the values, then that's what you have to build. 
um, and you have to think about it with every product feature. You have to think about it with every choice in infrastructure. You have to think about it with the policies that govern you, um, because we don't we don't get to guarantee that that the outcomes will be the right ones. Yeah, Reed. Well, I did open by saying I'm a techno optimist mm -hmm. versus a techno utopian. I do think that we can shape technology to be the solution to uh, many of these problems. Um, I do think that one thing that's also probably worth emphasizing is the other part of uh, things where I tend to be more in favor of kind of certain kinds of regulatory action is to demand transparency. Is to say, look, what's really going on, Axiom, et cetera. Because once you do that, you can begin to also figure out where do you uh, need to give that kind of individual empowerment and how do you do that um, in ways. Because look, as much as you'd say, hey, it's a free society, you make all these choices, like people make a, bad, a bunch of bad math decisions for themselves and sometimes you need to have society governing that and gambling or debt or other kinds of things because they, because uh, the bulk of people are not good at making math decisions so you should not allow a, kind of a private market to take advantage of them for that. And you do need to, do it, but, but getting transparency and a knowledge of that first and then figuring out uh, which ones, which levers that you may need to pull. And so, um, you know, what I, I guess what I would say is I do think that there's a set of problems. I think that people are in the companies are recognizing. I think that um, the key thing in thinking about this kind of area of so-called timing of so-called tech clash is to stay oriented on tech can be the solution. We just need to figure out how to get there. And I like your kind of call to action. And it's not just the current students, but it's like, well, if you're working at these companies and anything else, you know, uh, think about what your values-based approach to this is. And that's part of the reason why classes like this, yeah. that's interesting, uh, <laughs> classes like this are so important. I'm not even sure what that, is, does that count as Amber a fire alert, alert here? No, everyone's uh, Amber Alert. Oh, uh, right. We can now tell how many people have mobile <laughs> yeah. devices. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. All right. I was about to say there was some cyber. Jeremy and <laughs> Hillary, we'll end with you. Yeah. So, uh, so I also feel like Nicole that we are at a kind of policy reckoning moment. Um, and perhaps the only thing that's saving us from the actual realization of that reckoning is our own domestic dysfunction. Um, you know, on the other hand, you that's know- the it, optimistic thing. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not sure a reckoning goes very well, right? In the midst of a crisis. That's why I use the example of a Patriot Act. Um, you know, in a moment of crisis, you know, Russian misuse of the platform, you know, the kind of encryption crisis that we had a couple of years ago, you can think about things that lead to very quick and poorly thought through action that ultimately has long-term consequences. And you just kind of don't expect any action coming out of Washington right now, especially on something as complicated and nuanced uh, as we have. And so that suggests to me that, you know, Reed, if you're right, that the tech companies are beginning to wake up to the need to get ahead of this challenge uh, or the set of challenges that are being presented, there's sort of a moment in the midst of our dysfunction to try and figure out how to iterate, right? How to refactor in your words, um, you know, to address some of these consequences that have become manifest. Whether the tech companies will achieve that, I really don't know. Um, but I do think we have a window because of our dysfunction before the reckoning comes. Uh, that, that is a, a window to be exploited uh, by the tech companies. The second thing I just say on this is... Maybe leveraged for Leveraged, exploited, exploited. Yeah. 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 I mean, <laughs> depending on your perspective, right? <laughs> leveraged, you know, if, if to an end that we call yeah. this kind of moral legitimacy and social mm -hmm. end that you describe. The second thing just to say is, is that we've touched on the geopolitical, but I don't think we have really focused on just how damn hard the geopolitical component is. Right. Um, so I, I worked some in government on the creation of cybersecurity norms internationally. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring some order to the cyber security space, the weaponization of cyber tools that would bring a structure in the same way that we've tried to bring that to the nuclear proliferation space? The set of things that we could agree to with other governments you know, could fit on the palm of my hand. And we couldn't even agree to those. 
Um, and so when you begin to think about these conflicting interests and incentives, the sort of race that we have with other countries with different values, it just makes all the problems that we're talking about with respect to our own domestic experience of these technologies magnified massively. And at a time when we have these competing power centers in the world, not a lot of agreement on really most issues in the international mechanisms that we have, you know, my pessimism is even more in that space mm -hmm. than it is in this back and yeah. forth between the U.S. government and a set of technology companies that are headquartered here. Hillary, you get the last word. Uh, so I'll offer two things that give me some optimism. Uh, the first is, and if you're a person, and you probably are since you're enrolled in this class, who is tracking you know, the rough landscape of stories that happen to identify themselves as ethics of tech, <laughs> you read things that are you know, searing critiques of both the values of the individuals working at companies and the sort of organizational culture that allows them to operate in the ways that they are. And I think there's a vast delta between um, those stories and how they're written and the sort of heightened or sensationalistic version of them. And then also when you sit down face to face with somebody, especially somebody who's working on a product that is related to, you know, be it election interference or privacy concerns, which isn't to forgive anything that's gone wrong, all of the failed attempts that they've tried, but, it, but is to say, you know, from my vantage point, which is only one, um, I can appreciate that there are really smart people working hard within these companies on these problems, um, and it's not a sort of simplistic narrative. And then the second thing that gives me hope um, is the undergraduates that are in our course and that I've been interacting with over the last uh, year. And um, to be honest, uh, it, it's also easy to oversimplify what a young computer scientist might be thinking about or what their incentives are. But um, in our class, we see students who are genuinely and in earnest grappling with both their roles in these systems, um, how they can contribute to them, how they can improve them, and uh, it is extraordinarily heartening. All right, well, with that, uh, next week we convene to talk about algorithmic decision making. For now, thanks so much for joining us on a rainy night. Would you join me in thanking Reid Hoffman and Nicole Wong? <laughs> <laughs>